Rascal is the dog, he ain't too bright. Me and Rascal were sitting on the couch last night. When my woman come in and she started to cry, she looked it's at It's a brave us thing you did tonight, coming out to eye see eye some eye live eye music. Eye. Here in northern Michigan, here in our little town of Elk Rapids, it's a brave thing that Joe did, opening uh, friendly doors to the Elk Rapids cinema for a night he wasn't quite sure of. He said, Carrie, will there be a bunch of rock and roll people drinking and messing the play? No, I don't think so, but so don't mess it up and please don't get all crazy and stuff. And, well, you can get a little crazy, but you know, let's not get carried away. Mama didn't name me Carrie for nothing, did you, Mama? <laughs> so many people I want to thank, and every one of you individually, for making that brave, rebellious move of getting up off your couch and coming out and buying a ticket for the show at Elk Rapid Cinema tonight. I'm so glad to see all your faces. And, uh, um, you know, we might do some more of this. Weren't Matt and Katie amazing? Matt Watroba. <laughs> I forgot how much his voice just melts me like butter. It was lovely to hear, and Matt's coming back to Michigan, and Michigan's better off for it. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many stories of Don White in this house. Everybody's got their reason that they've heard of him, and it, again, I'd love to see those hands who have never seen a Don White show and just came out, whoa, we are gonna have some fun tonight because all of us who have seen him before are gonna be watching you watch him because it's just how it goes when you're at a Don White show and you've already been there once or twice or many, many times. My friend from Lynn, Massachusetts, I am so happy to see your face again. Last time I saw you, you were singing about teenagers. Now I know you're a grandpa and it might change things up a little bit, but maybe not too much. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend Don White. Hello, everyone. Let's have another big thank you for Matt and Katie, please. That was really good. We're good. So I see that there's a lot of people who haven't seen me, so um, when I know that, uh, haven't seen me before, I, I, I make the decision to do some of my good material. Um, so um, then I start out with a song that I've been starting with for many years. Just sort of helps to get me off to a good start. Um, this is a, a song that I wrote because I've been married 35 years. Congratulate me. That's not bad. 35. And this is a song that I wrote after my son went to college and my wife realized that there wasn't going to be any buffer between us anymore. It was a very difficult moment for Mrs. White, and she's so happy that I travel around the country sharing it with groups of strangers. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so happy to see you all and to be reunited with my friends Matt and Katie and, and Carrie Carlson. It's a very special weekend for me, so uh, I'm, I'm happy. Rascal is the dog, he ain't too bright. Me and Rascal were sitting on the couch last night. When my woman come in and she started to cry, she looked at us with such terror in her eye, 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 eyes. She said, I have raised these children for 18 years while you have done nothing. <laughs> Look, we found the pulse of the audience already. And now they're growing up and they're moving out of here And my big reward for all that I have been through Is this dog as dumb as mud And you, yippee yahoo Rascal looked at me in disbelief He said, she can't be talking about you and me She has got us to spend the rest of her whole life with Joe, please tell her how incredibly lucky she is and I said, who is going to love you any better than this? We'll wake you up every morning with big wet kisses. When we hear the police sirens in your neighborhood, we throw our heads up in the air and we howl for you. Oh, oh it's a wild night tonight. And, and that's cool. You got to admit, that's pretty cool. Well, you know, I don't believe we had succeeded in convincing her of the outrageous good fortune that had just befallen her. In fact, instead of looking happy as she could be, she looked a little bit, well, you know, homicidal to me. But hey, kids go to college and kids move away, but dogs and husbands, that's who stays. 
To you it seems like a terrible trick of fate, but me and Rascal don't see it that way. We're thinking, ain't we cuddly, ain't we cute? We're both real funny and we're both real true. There's another thing about us that is very cool. If you scratch us on our belly, our left leg moves. And you've got to admit that's cool. I think I'm scaring some of the new people. Well, okay, so maybe we ain't that smart. We're a couple of mutts with a lot of heart. This, boys and girls, is what I look like when I'm flirting. <laughs> and when I need new medication. It's getting harder to tell the difference. <laughs> but no one could ever love you better. I'll give you more loyalty than this dog is dumb as mud. Than this dog is dumb as mud. Than this dog is dumb as a mud. Me. How lucky can one girl be? She's got a dog like you and a man like me. We'll be together well into this next century. Put that knife down, baby. Rascal, I don't think that mom is too happy. Maybe we should seek for her. She always likes that. There appears to be at least a handful of potential canines in the audience this evening. Maybe if we told them about the domestic difficulties that we're having on the home front, they might chime in and sing along. You know, in a lot of communities, if you heard a hundred people in a movie theater howling at the top of their lungs the way that I expect we all will be doing in a minute, it might draw some attention. But I walked around Elk Rapids today and Saturday night. I don't think a bunch of howling coming out of a building is going to draw any attention at all, really. Kind of par for the course, I guess. So here, this is where I, I judge you whether or not you're going to participate in this thing at a level that's satisfactory to me. So after, when I count to three, we're all going to howl and see if we can shake them up at the restaurant over there across the street, all right? One, two, one, two, three. Nicely done. It's not bad, right? All right, I have two children. They're in their um, they're in their thirties now, but I spent a good hunk of my life raising teenagers, so I've had a lot of teenager experiences. If you've had the pleasure of living with teenagers, I know somebody that owns these ones do. Raise your hands up. Are right, the rest of you people look at these people with their hands up? Look how tired they are. <laughs> Teenagers are the most exhausting things on earth. I love them, but they're exhausting. And this is the way it works. At 11, they love you. Not always. <laughs> and not really. <laughs> but if they think you got some money, they might show you some fake affection and try to remove your money from you. Now, my daughter, when she was 13 and a half, was driving me so crazy that I actually threatened her. I said, listen, if you don't start treating me like a human being... Does this sound familiar to anybody? If you don't start treating me like a human being, I am going to get a job playing folk music <laughs> at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that's not the ultimate dad revenge. The one place you never expect to see your sorry old man, and there he is, standing in front of the gap. <laughs> Hi, honey. It's me, Daddy. Hey, everybody, that's my little baby. The problem with teenagers and with reproduction in general, frankly, is that you tend to reproduce people that are smarter than you. <laughs> that doesn't seem fair, does it? You're supposed to educate them and, call, and bring, you know, keep them in line, and they bring a larger brain into the equation. Now, my daughter is the smartest one out of all of us, and this is the way it worked for her. At 13 and a half, she was cruising down the highway of her life, and she hit an ice patch, and she went into a five-year tailspin. And we don't know where the hell she went. <laughs> 
put, we refer to it now in retrospect as the unpleasant era. <laughs> and then five years later, she came back, but she didn't come back gradually so I could acclimate to the new water temperature of my house. She came back instantly. It was like turning on a light switch. Ping, I'm back. I love you again. I'm nice now. And she looked at us like she was seeing us for the first time and wanted to know how we got so haggard looking. <laughs> well, the reason for that, Sybil. <laughs> we have to be old to know how funny that joke is. <laughs> That's like a nursing home joke. <laughs> the reason for that, Sybil, is because we've been living with your evil twin for five years. And we're burned out and exhausted, and we are just fragments of the people that you left behind five years ago. Now, I do this for a living, but I have always, while I was raising my children, I have always installed security systems in people's houses. And I live in a town called Lynn, Massachusetts, which I don't know what the Michigan equivalent of Lynn would be. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Pontiac or some, some town, working class town, well, with a little bit of an attitude problem. And so I've always told people that because I am an alarm installer, um, that it's really a public service. And when they ask me what I'm talking about, I say, well, for 20 years, years, really, I've just been trying to keep my friends out of other people's houses. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is when my daughter was 15 and a half, she was in the epicenter of adolescence. There's like a nine month period where just the sight of their parents makes their skin crawl up and down their arms and their head can spin in a complete circle. And they just, when they walk through a room, they leave behind this purple glow of angry, exploding hormones. <laughs> During this time, the epicenter of my daughter's adolescence, when the actual lava of adolescence could be seen rising up behind her eyeballs. I was walking by her bedroom one morning getting ready to go to work and I had a white flag in each hand because I've lost every fight I've ever fought in my house and I'm in a total state of surrender 24 seven. And I just stood there with my two white flags and I said to my daughter, I am not trying to oppress you, which has taken the place of good morning in my house. It's also the way I start all my sentences now. I'm not trying to oppress you, please pass me the potatoes, whatever it is. Just trying not to start a fight in the white family. So I go, look, just tell me the truth. Did you do your homework last night? Now, for those of you that still have children that love you, <laughs> talking about the small ones now, I'm gonna imitate my daughter's facial expressions and her tone of voice so you can prepare yourself for what's coming down the highway for you. I go, look, just tell me the truth. Did you do your homework last night? And she said, no. <laughs> Was that perfect? <laughs> Did you get the full frontal over here? No. I'm like, well, are you gonna? She goes, chia. I'm like, cha, now I don't understand the language in my house anymore. I go, well, when are you gonna do your homework? She said, I'm gonna do it this morning. I go, isn't it due this morning? She goes, you can leave now. And being the obedient dad that I have always been, I actually did leave. I didn't know what else to do. I was walking down the hallway holding my head wondering how my life got this way. This is a true story now. I went down to the bathroom and I bent over to pick something up off the floor and my nose started to bleed and blood was pouring out all over the place. I grabbed some tissue and I held it up like this and in two seconds it was all red and blood was running down my arm and being the diabolical parental genius that I have always been, I decided this would be an excellent time for me to go back down to my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> So I walked back down and I stood in the doorway with blood pouring out of my head onto the floor. And I said to my daughter, every time I talk to you about homework, my brain explodes. <laughs> and I thought I had won a small victory. But I must tell you people, it was the shortest lived victory in the entire history of parenthood. It was two seconds later, my daughter looked at me and said, Dad, I got to tell you something. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I can't wait to tell my friends down the mall. So I'm going to play for you now a song that I wrote when my kids were, were little, when they were little kids, and then they realized that their parents were psychotic. Um. Well, Mom, come home from work today. 
I tell you what she saw Every toy that me and my sister own Was laying out on the floor And the table was covered with peanut butter And half-eaten sandwiches There was cereal bowls, open jar of mayo And an empty can of tuna fish Dad was drinking a six-pack He had two or three bottles gone The sports page was laying on the living room floor And the football game was on Oh, and my tripped over my toy transformer That pushed her over the edge And that's when we knew she was turning into Psycho Mom again She's screaming, I'm fed up, I'm finished, I'm through I've had it up to here with both of you I'm running away, I'm leaving today I'm gonna join the carnival But first I'm selling you kids for a dollar a pound To a couple of cannibals They used to be normal Used to be calm I'm picking up after you animals Turn me into Psycho Mom Ma was working and dad was babysitting us the other night Me and my brother started yelling at each other and we got into a fight We were punching, kicking, scratching, pinching, pulling each other's hair Just about the time we knocked the TV over, we saw dad standing there Blood was bubbling, he didn't say nothing, he stood there at the door. Me and my brother took a look at each other and we looked up from the floor. And dad started to scream like a wild banshee and started pulling out his own hair. And that's when we knew he was psycho too and we better get out of there. He's screaming, I'm fed up, I'm finished, I'm through, I'm headed up to hell, I'm running away. To join the carnival But first I'm selling you kids For a dollar a pound To a couple of cannibals I used to be normal I never got mad Babysitting you animals Turn me into psycho dad Don't worry, there's a, just a little bit more For an hour our mother and our father Were trying to keep us in bed me and my sister never ever miss a chance to play with their heads We were using every excuse in the book to try to keep from going to sleep She said, I'm thirsty. I said, I gotta pee. She said, I forgot to brush my teeth We just got done with that classic one upon this fateful night Where you say it's too dark and they turn on the light and then you cry cause the light's too bright and Ma's eyes bugged out and Dad's head exploded and they both climbed up the wall. You should thank the Lord that you were not born to psycho Dad and Mom. They're screaming, we're fed up, we're finished, we're through. We've had it up to here with all of you. We're running away, we're leaving today. We're gonna join the carnival. But first we can sell you kids for a penny a pound. To anybody that will take you, we used to be normal. You remember, don't you, dear? It was 1974. We were hitchhiking around America trying to find ourselves. No, really, young people. People used to do that. You believe that? My wife and I hitchhiked for three years of our lives. We lived in ashrams and <laughs> hung around with vegetarians. And but I'm from Lynn, Massachusetts. I'm not supposed to know what an ashram is. met all these crazy people and it changed us changed us dramatically but now all these years later when I think about those three years and all of that stuff all I can really think about is that all I really did all we really did was we gave everybody our age a three-year economic head start <laughs> 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 Seems a shame now, really. <laughs> we never got mad. Raising you animals turned us into psycho mom and dad. All right. All right, I've been uh, touring um, in the last few years with Christine Lavin. I'm assuming some of you people know who Christine Lavin is, yeah? 
And her and I were touring, and the first show that we did was in, uh, in Chicago in 2008. It was at a place called the Old Town School of Folk Music. And I had never heard of such a thing, a school to teach folk music. And the skeptical part of me thought, you know, this may be one of the most colossal scams in the history of the world. A school to teach folk music, really? There's only three chords. <laughs> I'm not sure how big of a school you need, really. But there we were in this beautiful amphitheater, and over here was the professor of G, C, and D. They were all there, all the different professors. And so I felt an obligation that I should teach them something from my unique perspective in the folk community. So this is what I told them. I said, ladies and gentlemen, and professors of mandolin, or whatever you do here, this is how you can tell when a folk show is going down the toilet. And when a folk singer puts on his $2 smudgy spectacles and says, and now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall read an excerpt from my book. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This is my book. It's called Memoirs of a C Student. Memoirs of a C Student. It took five years to write this book. Five years. If I was a B student, I could have done it in a week probably. And on the back of my book, I put quotes from important people in my life because I saw that that's what other people did. I didn't have any important people that I could call upon, so I just have quotes from people in my family here. So the first one is from my wife, Teresa White, who grew up in the projects in near Boston, Massachusetts, and she's brought many interesting character traits from her childhood in federal housing into her adult life. <laughs> The one that's best represented here, I think, is one that I like to refer to as the um, Kerwin Circle Federal Housing Fundamental Absence of Subtlety. Um, and, and then she's got seven words here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in these seven words, she has distilled down to its essence how she feels about this enterprise and about her husband. This is what she chose to leave for eternity. This, this, this book will live longer than everybody in this room. This is her, this is her seven words for, for all eternity um, regarding me. And this is what she chose to wrote he, write here. <clears throat> this thing better make lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> now my brother drives a forklift at the airport there in Boston and he's a very astute observer of the world and um, this, these are his words that he chose to leave here on the back of my book for all eternity and regarding my book entitled Memoirs of a C Student <clears throat> I knew that this book was going to be a pack of lies <laughs> As soon as I saw the title, because my brother was a D student. <laughs> there it's right there. So I'm going to read you a little excerpt that will bring you so far into my family that you too will need a little therapy. And I'm doing this for my teenagers. There's several teenagers here, and I talk to their dad, and they're here because they've been bad. <laughs> You know, you could learn something out there if you have teenagers, you know, you know, if they're acting up, you say, look it, you keep it up and I will bring you to a folk concert. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dad, please, I'll be good. Dad, I'll be good, please. Not another song by a folk singer. Okay. But I'm playing this for my, my teenagers here because I want to give something to you. Because this is, just picture when you were 15 or 16, sitting in this room here with all of us aging delinquents that we are. I mean, it's, it, you know, I'm trying, I, I feel bad for them. I want to give them a gift. So if you pay close attention in here, within the context of this story, I'm going to describe to you how the, the, my children have developed um, ways of torturing their mother and father that you can apply to your own mother and father later. So, I mean, you know, I'm trying to include everybody here today. All right, my children make fun of me. They make fun of their mother too. There is nothing that we can do about it. Many years ago, we created these people through a mysterious biological process that bestowed upon them, among other things, our own unique wit and irreverence. Now, in an impressive example of accelerated evolution, they have taken our wit and irreverence to levels we never dreamed possible. Now, now pay attention, young people. They'll be dancing in a group with their friends at a party, and my son will suddenly yell out, everybody dance like mom! 
And then instantly, all the teenagers on the dance floor begin to perform their own individualized versions of the twirling hippie chick on acid at the Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> <laughs> so, after they exhaust the creative possibilities of this delicious parental mockery, my daughter will yell, Now everybody dance like dad! And then the entire group immediately breaks into improvisational interpretations of the mating dance of the adult male uncoordinated white guy who thinks he's cool. <laughs> <laughs> they call it the dork dance. <laughs> now this activity often culminates with them all lying in a heap on the floor and laughing uncontrollably. Now, in addition to having become a great source of comic relief for these young people, I have lost my ability to hold my own in repartee as well. For instance, my daughter recently told me that I needed a haircut. I told her that I had every intention of growing my hair down to my knees. She told me that I was having a midlife crisis. I told her, if I was having a midlife crisis, I would have a new Corvette. <laughs> and she uh -huh, would have a new mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Without missing a beat, before the last syllable of my sentence had traveled across the room to her ear, she looked at me and she goes, <laughs> you can't afford that. And then she did the sassy daughter dance and sang me this song. Here, I'll imitate her. She just jumps into this improv. She goes, you are having the poor boy's midlife crisis. <laughs> I think it's funny. Ha 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 ha. Then she danced out the door laughing. And I stood in the kitchen like Sonny Liston after the first round of his second fight with Cassius Clay. I was just looking around wondering what hit me and mumbling to myself that I used to be invincible around here. Now, there are many humbling moments in this business of child rearing. Perhaps the most impressive is when you realize that your own unique brand of obnoxious behavior has been processed and refined through the life experiences of your offspring only to reappear in the form of a much more deadly strain. <laughs> A much more deadly strain, capable of conquering the world, beginning, of course, with you. Now, there is nothing in a person's life that says it's time to pass the baton more clearly than getting your big behind kicked by a younger, smarter, stronger, cuter <laughs> version of yourself. All right. Thank you. This is the last song I'm ever gonna write about raising kids. I've written a lot of songs about raising kids and I'm not doing it anymore because I'm totally sick of kids and this is, the last <laughs> this is the last song I'm ever gonna write about raising kids and this is a song about the most difficult of the child rearing experiences. Maybe you think you know what the most difficult is. Um, maybe it's when they're little, like my grandsons. I have twin grandsons. I call them thing one and thing two. And they learned how to walk while they were at my house, living at my house for a while there. And it was like having two little drunk men bouncing around my house there for a while. <laughs> Maybe you think that's the most difficult, is when they're little, like thing one and thing two. And every little bacteria in the world is trying to find some orifice to get in and cause them great pain and suffering. And that would be a good guess, but that would be wrong. Now, maybe you think the most difficult is when they're teenagers and you haven't slept all summer because you're out with a pair of binoculars trying to find some keg party that you're sure they're at when they say they're sleeping at their friend's house. And that would be a good guess, right boys? <laughs> well, that would be wrong too. I'm here to testify that the most difficult of the child rearing experiences is when they're in their 20s and you try to get them to move out. <laughs> I 
Our kids are grown, they're both in their 20s. They live at home, they are never gonna leave. And why should they go? They've got it good here, you know. Their food, their phone, their rent is free. They would have to be out of their minds to leave. But I was thinking, what if things were different? You know, living here at home with you and me. What if we decided we could act like they both did when they were in their teens? So wake up, mama, climb out of this window. I've got the key, let's steal our daughter's car. <laughs> And we'll both get really drunk. We'll put a big dent in her trunk. And we'll drive real fast on the thoroughfare. If we get a speeding ticket, hey, we won't care. We'll be the ones up all night acting wild. They'll be the ones up all night worrying. We go, Mama, climb out of this window. Come on out and be 16 with me. Picture our kids calling all of our friends up, asking them if they know where we are. Of course, all our friends will lie and say they ain't seen us all night. But we'll be standing right beside them while they're on the phone, smoking and drinking and carrying on when we come strolling home on Sunday morning. Around 10 o'clock while the neighbors walk to church, kids will ask us where we've been and then they'll ask us again and we will just make up a great big lie and swear that it's the truth until the day we die and they will be the ones who are trying to find the truth out and we'll be the ones who are lying through our teeth and under pressure we'll confess that we had unprotected sex that will gross them out so much they might just start to think about moving out. <laughs> I think I'm hitting a nerve out there. <laughs> if turnabout is fair play in this life, then what better way to encourage them to live than to give them both a dose of what it was like to live with them when they were in their teens. So wake up, mama, climb out of this window. I got the key, let's steal our daughter's car. We'll both get really drunk. We'll put a big dent in her trunk. And no one will know where we are until we come home in the police car. <laughs> we'll be the ones up all night acting wild. And they'll be the ones up all night worrying. We go, Mom, climb out of this window. Oh, man, be careful. You're not as young as you used to be. That's 40 feet down there. I should have brought a ladder, probably. You know what? The kids are both drunk and passed out. Let's just go out the front door. Come on out and be 16 with me. So since I have my good friend Katie here, I'd like to get her to come up and sing a song with me. Could we encourage her, please? And Matt, you'll help her out. Good? All right. Um, so but Katie runs a great um, coffee house called the Greenwood Coffee House in Ann, Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I have been playing uh, since um, the year 2000. So I'm very grateful to her for, all, for keeping live music alive and, um, and for giving me opportunities to come out here and, and perform and to meet you all. I, uh, I, I didn't know anything about Michigan. I just started selling CDs out here um, way back. And... Uh, I thought it was a mistake. I thought I was getting somebody else's CD money. So I was having kind of an ethical crisis. Uh, <laughs> but I kept, I kept the money. <laughs> but I, I've come out here and I've, I've grown to love the place a great deal, you know? Um, 
not the least of which is because everybody's been so kind to me. I, I'm really a regional act. I mostly have, stay in Massachusetts and in New England, so the only other place I go is Michigan. And when I first started selling CDs out here, I was like, I didn't know where it was. I thought it was near Montana. <laughs> I thought they put all the M states together. I should have known better. I was in Massachusetts, but... Here's a song that I wrote many years ago and I've had the pleasure of singing with Katie for several years here, so I hope you like it. They both took their dreams and laid them to sleep Soon after their children were born Because you need to provide kids A stable environment and you need to be steady and strong but occasionally he will wake up his dreams To see how they feel in his hands And then he puts them away And goes to work the next day An ordinary family man Ordinary people will lay down their dreams Knowing they may not see them again And they do it for their families With strength and dignity Ordinary women and men Ordinary women and men she never thought twice about devoting her life to the care of her daughter and son. She works every night at a job she don't like. She does whatever needs to be done. But occasionally she will dress up her dreams and ask them if they'd like to dance. herself hold beautiful dreams in her hands ordinary people will lay down their dreams knowing they may not see them again and they do it for their families with strength and dignity ordinary women and men They sit with each other and they wait and they wonder on the day their first grandchild is born. And those dreams seem so distant. Now everything is different and they know they are right where they belong. When the child is passed to them, a light passes through them. They both know, they both understand. As they cradle that baby, they think they just may be an ordinary woman and man who are holding their dream in their hands. Ordinary people will lay down their dreams knowing they may not see them again and they do it for their families with strength and dignity ordinary women and men ordinary women and men ordinary women and men that. <laughs> Katie Ennis. All right, so I used to be a stand-up comedian. I used to do stand-up, but there was too much money in that. 
And I had to go back to being a folk singer, but I love stand-up, I love everything about it, I study it, I teach it, and if you know anything about stand-up comedy, you'll notice that a lot of comedians build their whole act on the differences between men and women. There's good reason for that, a lot of differences between men and women, and it's easy land for the mining of humorous material. Now, if you came to my house and you're trying to figure out the difference between my wife and I, there would be two things that would be obvious right away. The first thing would be blood pressure. That's right, I said blood pressure. I have high blood pressure. My doctor wants to put me on lisinopril. I didn't know what it was, so I went to the internet because the internet is where you go to learn everything that's not true about what you're interested in. <laughs> and there, in the deepest, darkest, most furthermost regions of the lisinopril section of the World Wide Web, I read that lisinopril was made from snake venom. Snake venom. I thought to myself, you know, when I was a younger man, the idea of taking a little snake venom on the weekend might have appealed to me. <laughs> but I am not a younger man anymore, and I do not want to take the snake venom, so I have to change my life. I have to stop eating salty food, I have to hydrate, I have to exercise, I have to do all the many things I have so successfully avoided to this point in my life. So I bought this machine to take my blood pressure. It's a box like this, it's got some buttons on it and a screen where some numbers come up in the screen and there's a tube that comes out and this thing wraps around my arm and I press the buttons and it sounds like this. <laughs> And then two numbers come up in the screen. Two numbers come up in the screen. And I don't like those numbers, so I do it again. <laughs> but this time, I'm thinking peaceful thoughts. I'm thinking peaceful thoughts. I don't want to take the snake venom. I'm, I'm trying to get in touch with my chakras or whatever that hippie girl was talking about. I don't know, but I'm just trying to breathe the right way. And, and, and I'm thinking about children playing in fields of sunflowers. And one part of me is so focused and breathing the right way and trying to get a number that's good out of this machine. And I'm focused with one side of my brain. And the other part of me is so aggravated that I have to do this when I'm focused on. I'm trying to do the right thing, trying to get a good number. I'm thinking, peaceful thoughts and I look in the doorway of my office and my wife is standing there and my wife has low blood pressure. Did I say low? I meant no. <laughs> she has a no blood pressure, none. And she's standing there eating a two pound bag of salty potato chips and she's taunting me. Why do you have high blood pressure? Munch, crunch, munch. I don't have high blood pressure. I have low blood pressure. Munch, crunch. You know, if you were more like me, you wouldn't have these problems. Crunch, munch, crunch. And I look at the screen on my machine and it says, call ambulance. <laughs> There's like smoke coming out of it. I'm like, I told you never to talk to me when I'm hooked up to this thing. Why do you have high blood pressure, crunch, munch? I don't have high blood pressure. I, I have low blood pressure, crunch, munch, crunch. I go, you know what? There's a good reason why you have low blood pressure. Why, why do I have low blood pressure? I said the reason why you have low blood pressure is because you are not married to you! <laughs> now, the other obvious difference between my wife and I is what it is we choose to watch on television. Now, if I have the remote control in my hand on those rare and glorious days when nobody's bothering me, I will always watch baseball because I love baseball. I love everything about it. I can find a baseball game on my TV when there's 15 feet of snow in front of my house. It's like a special gift that I have. And and I love it, but my wife hates it. She hates baseball. And when I'm saying she hates it, I'm not saying she don't like it. I'm saying she hates it. She hates it. And that is why I married her. And I can see you're not with me on this. Here, come closer. Let me whisper this to you. Marriage is difficult. A lot of problems, a lot of struggles. It starts out like this. Come here, I love you. 
of you kissy kiss, you are gonna buy a little house up in the country in Michigan. <laughs> And then you have these babies, and they love you. They love you. They look at you with their big eyes, and they just, they just ooze love for you. Then they grow up to be teenagers, and they hate you. They hate you. And, and uh, that's more pressure, harder to stay married. The kids, kids are driving you crazy, a lot of problems. Then you, you buy a house. You bought a house. You're at the, at the signing. You're signing papers, one after another. The lawyer, one, two, three, and they keep talking about this thing, an adjustable rate. You don't know what that means. One, two, three, four, five, like that. You know, then they, 10 years go by, ha, you know what it means now? It means you're never going to pay for that house. More pressure, more struggle, harder to stay married, more pressure on the marriage like that. Then you got a, a job interview, and, and the guy that was interviewing you, he was going to be your boss. He, and when he interviewed you, he seemed like a normal person, not like the psychotic that he turned out to be. And 10 years of working for a psychotic, oh, it's a lot of problems, a lot of struggle. So what I'm saying is, it's hard to stay married. It is hard to stay married. In order to stay married, married a long time, you have to build stress relief into every day of your marriage. So think about this. If you're a man or a woman and you love baseball and you marry someone who hates baseball, think about this over a 30, 40, 50 year marriage. That's 162 times a year for three glorious hours that the person you're married to will leave you alone. All I'm saying is you can stay married a long time if you can build 162 three-hour reprieves from each other into every summer. So it's a beautiful day in the middle of the summer, a million things I could be doing around that house. Instead, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching baseball and my wife will come in and look at me with such a disgust. And in her mind, she's counting down a list of 115 things that she's sure at this moment I could slash should be mowing, trimming, painting, sanding, bringing up from the basement, putting into the attic, something. But instead, I'm sitting on my couch, and I'm watching baseball, and it doesn't help that I got my shirt open so my belly button can watch the game, too. <laughs> That's not being helpful. I'm not being helpful in those moments. And she will look at me and my belly button with such disgust. And she'll look at the TV and look at me and look back at the TV and she'll say, there is nothing going on on that TV. It's just a bunch of men standing around in a field spitting and scratching themselves. And I will say to her, yes. <laughs> it's terrible. You, you should get as far away from this as possible. Unfortunately for me, I am hopelessly ensnared in their evil web. But you, you could save yourself! Save yourself, my darling! Now, conversely, and I know this is not possible, but I am here in front of these things to testify that the impossible is possible. If I walk into a room in the morning, in the evening, in the middle of the night, any time in the 24-hour cycle, and my wife has decided what to watch on the television in that room, 100% of the time, 100% of the time, I will look and there will be a woman crying on the television. That is not possible. There cannot always be a woman crying on the television. Now, um, uh, we have the Fios plan at my house. So I was looking through the book to figure out what I'm paying for, and I see we have Showtime and Cinemax and HBO, and there it was, the Crying Woman's Channel. <laughs> Did you know you were paying for the Crying Woman's Channel? Now that is a difference between men and women. In my adult life, any time I've had an opportunity to go through a list of my entertainment options for a given evening, the idea of watching a woman in crisis crying on my television, it doesn't make the top 1,000. <laughs> my wife gets something out of it that only she can understand. And because I'm a good husband, and I'm trying to get in touch with my extraordinarily elusive feminine side, <laughs> Sometimes when she's watching the Crying Woman's channel, I will come in and I will sit beside her and I will study it. And she hates when I do that. Because <laughs> she knows it's only a matter of time before I start mocking the program. <laughs> 
but I don't start out that way. I have good intentions. I'm trying to do the right thing here. I love you. 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 I, you have to explain this to me. I don't understand it. You worked all day. You came home. You did a bunch of things around the house. You have one free hour of time that you can do with what you want. I need to understand why the only free hour that you have in the whole day you need to give to this woman on the television. Eye makeup running all over the place. Everybody's lying to her. She's got some kind of disease only Oprah can understand. I need to know. I need to know what. <laughs> and I will study the Crying Woman's channel. And within seven minutes, seven minutes, an invisible tube comes out of the television and it lodges into the front of my cranium. And with every syllable that is feloniously called dialogue on the Crying Woman's channel, I can feel the television sucking numbers off the top of my IQ. <laughs> After a half an hour, I lose my ability to do small multiplication tables. And after 45 minutes, I'm just sitting there crying and I don't know why. Now, a couple years ago, my wife had surgery, minor surgery. That's what people were calling it. Let me tell you something, boys and girls. There are precious few absolute truths in this world, but here is an absolute truth. Between this minute and the day you die, I guarantee you that any time you hear the term minor surgery, that it will be coming out of the mouth of a person who is not having the surgery. I don't know what world you live in, but what happened, my wife had her gallbladder removed. Now, I don't know what world you live in, but in my world, Donnie Land, I call it, over here in Donnie Land, reaching in, yanking out an internal organ, not minor. <laughs> if you think it is, how about I just jump off the stage and kind of pick somebody in the middle here and just sort of start the process. I think we can all rest assured that if we see Don White, the folk singer from Boston, Massachusetts, removing our gallbladder, we'll be thinking to ourselves, you know, something major is happening to me. <laughs> so they're taking her down to surgery, and she's got an IV in both arms, and her arms are tied down to the bars on the side of the gurney there, and she couldn't move them, and she started to cry. And she asked me if I would wipe her eyes for her, and I said, okay, I'll do that. Um, and I wiped, took a tissue, I wiped her left eye and her right eye. And while they were wheeling her down to surgery, I took the tissue and I folded it this way and that way, and, uh, and I put it in my pocket. Why? I'll tell you why. Because if something happened and she didn't come out of that surgery, I would have treasured those two teardrops for the rest of my life. What am I saying? I'll tell you what I'm saying. I'm saying being married to this woman for 35 years has made me a girl. <laughs> I'm a girl now. And I have a new appreciation for the Crying Woman's channel. <laughs> Thank you. So how are you doing? Are you getting tired? Yes? Is that a yes? No? No? All right. Well, well I am getting tired. So how about a couple more songs and then we'll get Katie up. Can you handle another 15, 20 minutes of this madness? Does that work for you? All right. I'm trying to think of what to do for you now. I ha can't really gauge you yet. I haven't figured you out. Um, the crying sign. We are very what? Very hip. You know, I was looking at the crowd and that's what I was thinking. I'm like, this, this may be the hippest crowd I've ever seen. And, and you know, I've been around. <laughs> we're, you know, Don, we're very hip here. Not sure that anyone has ever said that to me before. <laughs> I, normally, I would say, does anybody want to hear something? But you, none of you know who I am. <laughs> kind of 
a foolish question, really. <laughs> oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll send this song out to my wife. My wife, I've been married all these years, and, and I, I don't, I, I, I really like like sassy um, women. Like I am drawn to, I don't want to say bossy because I don't like to be bossed around, but I do like, um, like I guess you'd call strong, strong women. And my wife is definitely that way. So here's a song about how we talk to each other um, when we feel it's necessary to talk at all. <laughs> In the 31, 32, 33, 34, can you believe it, 35 years that we have been wed. I've wondered if you ever heard a word I said Till I said pass that remote control over here And you told me to blow it out my ear I love you, you're a sassy brat You make me mad and you make me laugh God, please don't cut our time in half Let me grow old with my sassy brat When my fans call up and say that I'm great you tell them that that is a huge mistake That if they had to live with me they would understand What a big pain in the ass I am I love you, you're a sassy brat You make me mad and you make me laugh God, please don't cut our time in half Let me grow old with my sassy brat now there are men who like a women who they can dominate They bring them breakfast in bed and always tell them that they're great Well my sassy lady never does that for me But at least a life with her is definitely not boring She says if you want me to believe that you're great Do a couple loads of laundry around here someday Hey pal, it's only because you're still kinda cute that I haven't already gotten rid of you. Love you, you're a sassy brat. You make me mad, you make me laugh. God, please don't cut our time in half. Let me grow old with my sassy brat. You say the kids have both gone to the show. How about a little quickie before they come home? And I say, oh, I suppose you think you're really slick The way that you keep emphasizing little and quick <laughs> I feel like I'm torturing you now. All right, I'm not that sure I love you. You're a sassy brat. You hurt my big ego and you make me mad. Please don't cut our time in out. Sassy brat Sassy bratty lady Been hanging around here Driving me crazy 35 years if I could ever afford To see a psychiatrist I'd ask him why the hell do I like Being treated like this We were in bed But we were still awake You said I really love you In this life we've made I said hey can I quote you on what you just said? You told me if I did, you'd punch me in the head. I love you, you sassy brat. You make me mad, you make me laugh. God, please don't cut our time in half. Let me grow old with my sassy brat. I hope it's not too much to ask. Let me grow old with my sassy Brat. All right. Did the hip people like that? Was that hip? That was hip. All right. All right, I'm going to tell you one brief story here. We'll get Katie and Matt up here and wind this thing down. Let's take a minute, if we could, and just thank everybody that worked so hard to put this on. I know, I think this is the first time that they've done something like this here, at least in recent um, history. So we're all very grateful to Joe, who runs it, and Carrie, and all the volunteers, and everybody that worked so hard. So let's give them a nice round of applause, everybody. Thank you, Joe. So this is my last story I want to tell you. It's, it's not a long story, um, but, but um, 
I've been having a lot of fun with it lately. So as I told you, I install security systems uh, a couple days a week just so that I don't have to take every rotten gig that's out there underneath a hockey game, you know, in a bar room. <sighs> now I'm having a moment just remembering all the hockey game gigs I've had now. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Now, so, so, I don't know, six months ago, I'm on a job swinging a hammer, pulling fire wire across this old building there, trying to put a fire system in, and all of a sudden, I get a sharp pain running down my left arm, and it stays there all day. Sharp pain, left arm, old people, anybody want to talk about that? <laughs> Not good, right? When I tell young people I have a sharp pain running down my left arm, they're like, why don't you go to the gym? But us old people know the gym is not going to solve that problem. So sharp pain left arm stays there all day. Then it starts running across my shoulder blades and then across my chest. So I have pain here, across my shoulder blades, and chest pain. I guess you could say I was having chest pain. So I am a conscientious father and a grandfather. A lot of people in this world counting on me. So I did not waste one minute. I did not waste one second. I went directly to the internet. <laughs> I started typing in my symptoms. It kept bringing me to this website. www. Guess who's having a heart attack? Dot <laughs> omg. Omg. That's a little joke for the young people there. Now. Listen, I have two doctors. I have a bad doctor and I have a horrible doctor. <laughs> so I called my horrible doctor and I left a message describing my obvious heart attack symptoms on the phone message. And uh, three hours go by, nobody calls me. Three hours, nobody calls me. Finally, my other doctor calls me and, uh, and he says, Don, what's going on? And I, uh, I explain it to him and he says, you, need to go to the emergency room. And I said, I am going to go to bed. And he made this sound, oh, which I have translated. And um, this is the translation. I need to retire soon. All of my patients are idiots. I don't want to go to the emergency room because I live in Lynn, Massachusetts, a factory town with an attitude problem, and I, I don't want to go there. I, 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 I don't know where your emergency room is around here. Probably in somebody's house, for all I know, but... <laughs> that's a little jab at the fact that you're in the country up here. All right, now. I don't want to go, I assume that your emergency room experience is a reasonably civilized one. I want to describe to you what it's like to go to the emergency room in Lynn, Massachusetts on a Friday night, but I can't do it. I can't describe it. It is not describable. It's what the world looks like just before it ends. I'm not kidding now. You go in there on a Friday night, and there's 25 heroin addicts who took a brick to their own hand. Smash! Oh, I need some Oxycontin for this problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling junky jokes in Elk Rapids, Michigan. That's got to be a first. All right. No. <laughs> And so the nurses are just jaded and they've heard every lie that's ever been told and there's all these people, people in there that are just unsavory and unpleasant to be around and I don't want to go, but I go. And I learned something when I went there and this is going to be my parting gift to you. This is a piece of knowledge that I have learned that you will actually somewhere in your life be able to use. You know how when you go to the emergency room it takes a long time to see the doctor. Well, boys and girls, it turns out that there are Two words that you can say that totally, completely change all of that. Do you know what they are? Chest pain. Chest pain is the magic two words. If you say chest pain, the duck comes down and Groucho gives you the money. <laughs> now that is a nursing home joke. <laughs> you guys on front, Groucho was a comedian. He lived a long time ago. Never mind. All right. So I go up to the window, I say the kid behind the glass, he says, Mr. White, what's going on? I say, I am having chest pain. He said, 
chest pain? Ba -ba -da 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 -da! Mr. White, you are our grand prize winner! A disco ball comes down, a band starts playing, there's confetti everywhere. Step right in! We have a nice table for you over by the window. Your waitress will be with you in just a minute. And while they're taking me from the waiting room into where the doctors are, I can hear all the junkies behind me. They're like, what does he have? Chest pain? Oh, I have that. <laughs> I have chest pain. I need some Oxycontin for this chest pain. That I have. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so. I get in there, and they gave me nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, I had never had it before, never. I didn't know anything about it, and I, and, and I loved it. I loved it, I mean, I, I loved it, I loved it. They, I, I was kind of fatigued when I went in there, kind of worn out, and they put this pill under my tongue, and then I'm like, wow, wow! I can feel my blood going everywhere. I expected blood to come shooting out of my toenails. I'm like, I love this, I love it. Then I started thinking to myself, why, as a man of the 60s and 70s, has it taken me so long to discover this little gem? <laughs> <laughs> and then they gave me morphine. I'm like, nitroglycerin and morphine? No wonder all these junkies are hanging around down here. <laughs> So now I'm in an altered state, an altered state. I'm on morphine. I'm in an altered state of consciousness. And my kids come, and my wife come, and they're looking down at me. <coughs> you know how in a movie, when a guy's on his deathbed, they put the camera on the pillow and look up like it's the guy looking up at the three blurry heads of his family looking down at him? It was like that. I'm looking at my wife and my son and my daughter, and they're kind of fuzzy around the edges there. And, and they're looking down at me. Dad, we love you. Don't worry. Everything's going to be great. Everybody's coming. Your brother's on his way. Your your sister's coming. We're all going to be here. Dad, we got the best doctors in the world. Well, Dad, maybe not the best. <laughs> we're not sure they're any good at all, really. But we're going to try to make sure they don't kill you, Dad. And I can see that they're worried and they're concerned about me. And I love them. I love them. And I want to comfort them. I want to say something to them that will comfort them. And so uh, I'm thinking about the comforting thing I want to say. And I'm getting ready to say it. But I have to remind you, I was in an altered state of consciousness because of all these amazing things they were putting under my tongue and all of that. So I go to open my mouth to say the comforting thing that I'm thinking of to take care of my family. Family, and this sound comes out. <laughs> Have you guys ever tried nitroglycerin? It's unbelievable! <laughs> the next day, they gave me a stress test stress test and I passed the stress test and they said Mr. White what kind of medication do you take and I said I don't take any except I take lisinopril high blood pressure medication because I've been married for 35 years <laughs> for some reason it's destroyed my vascular system so and this is what they discovered they said um, my, my doctor, my, uh, my, my regular doctor, was giving me too much lisinopril, maybe a little bit too much high blood pressure medication. And six weeks earlier, for some reason that nobody's been able to explain to me, my horrible doctor doubled the dosage, doubled the dosage, and it turned my blood into maple syrup, and my heart was like, I can't push this shit through here. <laughs> <laughs> Now listen to me, listen to me boys and girls, I know that at this point in the story we need a moral, we need a moral to this story. If you were looking at a picture of this story, there'd be a big empty space with arrows pointing at it, saying, insert moral here. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. I have no idea what the moral of this story is. 
And I've thought about it a lot. I've been telling this story for six months now. And this is the only thing I can think of. And I mean this very sincerely to everybody here. You've been very kind to me. And I want to leave you with this one thought here. If by chance anybody in this room at any time, any time, but if, if right now tonight, if by chance anybody in this room tonight happens, happens to have any extra nitroglycerin. <laughs> You got some? All right. <laughs> if you want to meet me at the CD table, there's an excellent chance that you could go home with the entire Dawn White collection tonight. <laughs> All right, please welcome back to the stage Matt Watroba and Katie Guinness. care of her there. So, did you guys have fun so far? Come on now. Do you love Carrie Carlson? Come on now. So, um, this is a song that Carrie used to play a lot on the, um, uh, on the radio back then. It made me a lot of friends out here. I'm going to sing it for you guys here now tonight with my, with my friends. You know, I was telling these young guys, some musicians here, that uh, one of the great things, even if you never make a nickel in music, is that you get to make music with people that you love. And when you love the people that you make music with, it makes the music bigger and more beautiful. So um, we've been doing this all weekend. We're going to do it for you here. And I suspect that you will see that um, we are all very dear friends of each other, and it affects this, this music a great deal. So um, thanks for coming out, and I hope you like like this. There is a little girl with pretty curls. She's about five years old. And she is waiting at the gate for her dad to come home. When he pulls around the corner in his shiny white car, she feels the magic light up in her heart. And he picks her up and he holds her. He says he missed her. He's glad that she is here. As the child lays her head on his shoulder, she whispers these words in his ear. Daddy, I know exactly what love is. Love is real simple and true. Love is this feeling my heart gets when I'm being held close by you. Now she is 20 and there's plenty of love everywhere. She's getting married, so her family and her friends are all there. They've gathered this morning to stand at her side as she waves goodbye to this time in her life. They each take a moment to hold her and to tell her what she means to them. In a world that seems to keep getting colder, she has been blessed with a warm family and friends. She says, I know exactly what love is. Love is real simple and true. Love is this feeling my heart gets when I'm being held close by you. 
Now they are older and no one told her it got crazy like this. They're going to night school, they're working jobs too, and they are raising three kids. The youngest one is crying with a bruise on her knee. She needs attention and she needs sympathy. And when she picks her up and she holds her, that old magic lights up in her heart. And as the child lays her head on her shoulder, she knows exactly why they're working so hard. Little girl, I know exactly what love is. Love is real simple and true. Love is this feeling my heart gets when I'm being held close by you. No, they are 60 and their history spans 40 odd years. They have buried their parents. Now their grandkids are here. There's something about the way they look in each other's eyes that speaks softly about the meaning of a life. And when he puts his arm out to hold her, it feels so familiar and warm. She thinks love is an expanding endeavor till your last breath from the moment you're born. She says, I know exactly what love is. Love is real simple and true. Love is this feeling my heart gets when I'm being held close by you. Now she is 80 and she hates being in this nursing home. Her man's been gone now for a long while and she feels so alone. She closes her eyes and she begins to pray that a little comfort might just come her way. And God lifts her up and he holds her. And she remembers this feeling she has. She is not a woman whose life is almost over. She's a little girl being held by her dad. And God, I know exactly what love is. Love is real simple and true. Love is this feeling my heart gets when I'm being held close by you. And God, love is real simple. Love is real simple. Love is real simple and true. Thank you. Thanks. Katie Geddes, Matt Watroba, Don White.
All right, so normally that would have been the end of the show and we would have gone backstage to wait for an encore, but it's a big hole right there <laughs> and we're afraid to do it. So we're just gonna pretend that we went away and we came back and this is our encore. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna sing an old, um, an old traditional folk song. I'd like you all to sing along. And I uh, most uh, the fellow that was helping us out here earlier, his name is Josiah. He sings in the choir and he sings all over the place. So I was backstage and I taught him the chorus. So let's we'll give him a round of applause. We'll drag him up here too. Josiah, you're a local talent. <laughs> you wanna share, share one of these with him or something? So I said, you know, this song is called Irene Goodnight Josiah. Um, it was one of the most popular songs in the world at one time. And he said, I feel bad, I don't know it. I goes, because <laughs> it was a long time ago, man. <laughs> um, but uh, so we'd like to hear you sing on this one. This is a good one. And I, you know, um, it's a good community here. And um, when you raise your voices up, it does something to help everybody who's hurting out there in the town. So let's do that as we say goodbye. Thank you again for being so sweet to me. Uh, hope you'll have me back again sometime. I would love to come back and see you. All right. So it's a good room, a lot of, it's a live room. The Joe was telling me they, they deliberately didn't put carpets up on the wall or didn't like muffle the sound like a lot of places do because um, they, they like the sort of live sound in here. So when we all sing, it's gonna sound great. So here we go. Sometimes I live in the country. Sometimes I live in the town. Sometimes I get a great notion to jump into the river and drown. Now everybody sing, Irene, good night. Irene, good night. Good night, Irene, good night. song goes.
my dreams Sometimes I live in the country And sometimes I live in the town And sometimes I get a great notion To jump into the river and drown Beginning now Thanks for a great night, everybody. Hey, let's take a bye like we're the Beatles. Right, right? <laughs> One, two, three, four. Hey. Yeah. One time more, because we really love them. Yeah. Here you go. Rick, thank you for Josiah. We couldn't have done it without him. <laughs> All right. Drive on through the broken gate, past the booth now still and dark. Once the cars were bathed in light spilling over from the park I'd flip my keys to Jim or Steve, find my seat and have a beer But this old house is coming down, they used to play baseball here The stadium has moved downtown, leaving nothing on the street They traded in a neighborhood for a corporate box or suite Know it's good for business.